Royal Caribbean cruises come in many forms, and this year, I got a chance to try a lot, but I have a list of things I'll never do again on a Royal Caribbean cruise up next. Hey everyone, it's Matt from RoyalCaribbeanBlog.com, and between myself and the people on my team, we go on a lot of cruises, but even with our frequent sailings to keep you up to date on the latest Royal Caribbean news, we still run across things that we think were not great and something we'll skip from now on. Now, I thought about all my cruises this past year to come up with my list of eight things I tried on a Royal Caribbean cruise in 2022 that I'm never doing again. So heed these words and consider yourself warned against these pitfalls that I ran into. Starting with number one, forgetting to enter all the information into the app before check-in. So going on your cruise, you have the opportunity to enter your personal information into the Royal Caribbean app for check-in. You're going to enter your passport information, your birth certificate, whichever one you have, upload a photo, add in your emergency contact information, do a check-in time, all that good stuff. On a couple of cruises, I just plain forgot to do it all. Maybe I did something, but didn't quite finish it all. Must always remember the check-in time, but then I forget to go back in and enter my passport information, upload selfie photos. And every time I think about it, I'm like, eh, it'll be fine. We'll get to the terminal, take an extra minute or two. Well, the reality is it might take a minute or two if it's just one person, but we're there with my family, family of four, that means they've got to go through the whole process for every single person. It takes up time, time that I would rather not be standing around in, in the terminal doing those kinds of tasks and instead be one step closer to being on board the ship or heck already on the ship. You know, what's really been great about the Royal Caribbean check-in process now, especially with the app and some things being a little more expedited is that getting on the ship is a lot faster. And it seems like boarding times have gotten a lot better. And that means getting on the ship a lot sooner. So if I'm sitting there in the cruise terminal and we've got to take the time to enter passport information, take a selfie photo and all that other information for everybody in my family, all I can do is look over my shoulder and realize there are other people getting on the cruise and I want to get on there too. Yes, of course, we're talking about an extra couple minutes here, but every minute of your vacation counts. And at the end of the day, this was something I could have done quite easily at home from the couch, quite frankly. This isn't like I had to go stand on my head and do it. It would have been super easy. Anyway, from now on, I am making a note to ensure that we always put in all information in the app before check-in. It's just super easy. Why not? Number two, and this is something that if you listen to me talk about dining a couple of years ago, I'm sure this has changed, but that is definitely not scheduled dinner past 7.30 p.m. So when I first started cruising, this is back you know, before I had kids and even before I was even married, I usually did a late dinner in the main dining room, like, you know, eight o'clock or so. And part of that reason was I thought it was good because it allowed me to free up the afternoon and then roll in for dinner and do whatever. Well, a couple of things have changed. And as a result, I now will not schedule dinner past, I would say 7.30 p.m. I really want to angle for about seven o'clock. That's like the sweet spot. And even earlier is not bad. Now, yes, I'm getting older. I'm not quite ready for the blue plate special. And no, five o'clock is not too late for dinner. But I just find that having a little earlier dinner means you have more of the evening to enjoy. Now, on the flip side, when you have an earlier dinner, that means, yeah, you're probably not having as much time in the late afternoon to do whatever. But the reality is, number one, I'm not at the pool. I'm not the kind of person who sits out on the pool deck and is there until, you know, four or five o'clock. So getting ready for dinner in the four o'clock hour or even earlier than that, like three something is not a big deal to me. I don't mind that at all. And number two, I like when I get out of dinner, it still feels like the evening is out there, meaning that I feel like I can still go see a show, go to the bar to see the performance and maybe even go to the casino without it already being like 1 a.m. or something like that. When you have a later dinner, especially a dinner that's after eight o'clock p.m., I feel like you're probably not getting out of dinner until about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. And that leaves you not a ton of time unless you're okay staying up until well past midnight. And as I get a little bit older, I like going to bed a little bit earlier. I mean, I'm not against staying out late. In fact, I'm, there are plenty of cruises in which I still stay out pretty darn late, but burning the candle on both ends is just a fool's errand. And at least in my experience, I can't speak for everybody out there, but I'm I'm reaching the point of the law of diminishing returns when it comes to this. So having a little earlier dinner, 6.30, 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock, something like that, it just seems like I get more out of my evenings and I don't feel like I'm running against the proverbial clock in that I just hear, oh gosh, it's already midnight, oh gosh, it's already 1 a.m. And now you get into this situation of like, well, do I sleep or do I have fun and then pay for it in the morning? So scheduling my dinners for earlier in the evening just ends up being a better fit. And for our kids, quite frankly, it's also much better for them. So for those reasons, we'll schedule earlier dinners. Again, nothing past 7, 7.30 or so. Number three, I'm not packing an over-the-door shoe organizer ever again. 
I did this as part of, you may recall, an Inside Cabin Hacks video, when which I went on Mariner of the Seas, got all these great Inside Cabin Hacks that were from a lot of our friends here on YouTube, and I put them to the test, and some of them worked, some of them didn't work, but the one that I really thought, boy, this was a waste of not only money, but just my time and packing space, was the over-the-door shoe organizer. Basically, the idea here is you go to like the dollar store, you buy the shoe organizer, and you put it either on your bathroom door in your cabin, or maybe you just your regular room door that goes out to the hallway. Anyway, you put it there, and it gives you plenty of extra storage space. Okay, I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm saying it's not really practical. What I mean by that is, number one, even on the older ships, I think there's enough space to put things away. Maybe not everything, but it's really clothes that are the problem. Not like extra space for, I don't know, my flip-flops or sunscreen. Like, those are not my issues. It's really just closet space for clothing, and the over-the-door shoe organizer doesn't help with that. So ultimately, I just felt like it just didn't work. And so if I'm going on a cruise, whether it is on Vision of the Seas or Oasis of the Seas or Wonder of the Seas or Brilliance of the Seas, not packing an over-the-door shoe organizer, just don't think it works nearly as well as maybe some people make it out to be, unless you just have a lot of stuff with you. I'm just not that person. We do bring a lot of stuff. I just don't see it. So I'm going to leave that at home. The next thing I'm never not doing again is not printing out luggage tags. Kind of similar to our number one issue where I talked about that I'll never not do the pre-cruise check-in. Here, the luggage tags are something that I can sometimes forget and I need to make sure I never forget about it again. You know, the cruise we did out of Los Angeles right at the end of 2021 into 2022 I didn't print out luggage tags. I don't remember if I've just plain forgot them or just thought, ah, it'll be fine. But man, we paid the price over there and just wasting a lot of time waiting for luggage tags. And that may be the Port of Los Angeles thing. I don't cruise out of LA that often. But you know what? Every single time, whether it's Port Canaveral or LA, I just find like I'm just wasting time with these kinds of things. And it's really easy to print out luggage tags in advance. Again, just like doing the check-in, it's one extra thing to do at home, but I'd rather do it because number one, it makes it easier on the porters. All I have to do is just give them the bags and that's it, all done on my way. Number two, there's less concern that the luggage tag is incorrect. What I mean by that is I remember doing this in the port of Galveston when I was on a lure of the seas and the porter asked me, okay, which side of the ship are you on, port or starboard? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. I had to go look it up in the app and you know what? It just left a bad taste in my mouth because what if I didn't look at it correctly or I didn't get my left from right correct? Anyway, it's just easier to print it out. So from now on, after I do the pre-cruise check and all that good stuff, I'm going to remember to print out the luggage tags every single cruise that I do so I don't leave them at home. Number five, I'm not going to feel obligated to go to a specialty restaurant for every meal, even if I have the unlimited dining package. So when I first started buying the unlimited dining package, I was like, all right, well, I got seven nights of a cruise and these many port days, and this many sea days. I'm going to make sure we go to a meal every single one. If I do this, especially on longer sailings, heck, four night sailings are longer. I just feel like I'm just eating for the sake of eating. And in a lot of cases, I'm not even hungry for these meals. I'm just going because I have it. So the reality of the unlimited dining package is, even if you skip a couple different meals and instead go to like the Windjammer for dinner or even the main dining room for that matter, what I find is you're still coming out way ahead compared to paying for the other restaurants individually. What I mean by that is in a lot of cases, the unlimited dining package is going to cost you somewhere between, I'm going to guess $100 and $200. It can be a little bit more depending on the sailing, but you kind of get that. That's per person, right? If you ever looked at the price of like Chops Grill for one person, if you don't have a dining package and pay a la carte, you're talking about like 50 bucks easy. So two restaurants, you're at $100. So basically what I'm trying to say is you're more than likely going to break even on that dining package. Even if you skip a couple different meals there, it's not the end of the world. You're still getting plenty of value out of that dining package purchase. Number six, speaking of dining, is I'm never going to eat at Hooked again. Now, apologies to all the fans out there that loved Hooked. I am not here to tell you that you shouldn't eat at Hooked. My issue with Hooked is the menu, quite frankly, and it's a personal choice that I have. But in the interest of sharing this list with you of things that I, Matt, will never do again on a cruise, I'm adding this to my list here. But again, it's not a reflection that the restaurant is bad for everybody, just bad for Matt. What I mean by this is I don't eat shellfish. And the menu is heavily dominated by shellfish. And I had gone to Hooked a couple different times on both Navigator of the Seas and Symphony of the Seas. And I just went back to Hooked again on Wonder of the Seas. And I said to myself, all right, self, we're going to put our big boy pants on here. And we're going to see, you know, is it as bad as I remember or just not as desirable as I remember? And the answer was, it's not as desirable as I remember. Bottom line is there are other restaurants on the ship I would much rather eat at. I can come up with at least three, four, five restaurants that I would much rather prefer to dine at than hooked. In fact, pretty much every specialty restaurant, even the main dining room, I'd rather eat at than hooked. But again, that's a personal decision. 
And when it comes to specialty restaurants in general, this is your money you're spending, right? And if there's a menu that just does not appeal to you, but everybody else says it's great, that's okay. You don't have to go there. You know, part of going on a cruise is curating it to your experiences. In the same way that I might say, I don't want to do that particular activity that's listed in the cruise compass doesn't mean that others can't enjoy. It's just not my cup of tea. So in this case, I'll be skipping hooked for my future cruises. Number seven, and this one is, I think, one that really took some soul searching, but I am not going to go on as many cruises as I did in 2022. So after cruises came back in 2021, I really got on the, I need to make up for a lost time bandwagon. Now, part of that is the fact that I do run, of course, realcaribbeanblog.com. And I know that you all count on me to go on cruises to do research and kind of share with you what's happening on cruises out there. Now, before you play the world's tiniest violin for poor, poor Matt, who has to go on cruises a lot, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is I did 14 cruises in 2022. I actually should have done 15, but I had COVID in Alaska, so I missed out on one. But the bottom line is that was just a lot of cruising. And I think there's a couple of reasons why I don't need to do as many cruises in 2023 that I did in 2022. First of all, we have an amazing staff of writers and vloggers and videographers here on royalcaribbeanblog.com and over on our sister site, cruise.blog. They're wonderful people, very talented. I want to empower them to go on cruises and we can cover a greater swath of the cruising experience. So we're not compromising on the coverage we're giving you. But number two, and more importantly, I think that there is something to be said about making cruises feel a little more special. I enjoy every cruise I went on. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I didn't enjoy any of the cruises I sailed on, but having some time away from it made my heart grow fonder for going on a cruise. And when there was a more sizable gap, like more than a couple of weeks, I started thinking to myself, boy, I'm kind of getting excited for going on a cruise again. And so I kind of like that feeling. And so I feel like there needs to be a happier medium between, you know, obviously not cruising or cruising once a year and cruising 14 times in the same calendar year. Ultimately, what makes cruising special to me is the idea that it is different than the real world. People often ask me, Matt, would you ever want to live on a cruise ship or, you know, cruise all year round? And the answer is no, I personally wouldn't want that because I appreciate cruising way more when it's a contrast to my everyday life. You know, when you're at home and you make dinner every night or you take the kids to school or you're doing all these other errands, those are the things obviously you don't enjoy doing. And then you go on a cruise and get a break from all those things, right? And a microcosm, that's what cruising is so special and why I really, really enjoy it. So looking at my cruising schedule for 2023, I'm trying to slow a little bit down. Now, before all of you think I'm going on like two cruises for the year, don't worry, this will be plenty of sailings, but I'm trying not to go on, you know, one cruise every calendar month, which is what I ended up doing in 2022. It was fun. I enjoyed it, but I think that's just too many cruises for my style. So I'm going to tap the brakes a little bit. Please don't think I'm going not cruise or, you know, cruise like three times. I'm still gonna be cruising a lot by most people's standards, but I'm trying to find a happier balance there. So it can feel a little more special and really resonate with that pre-cruise excitement of, yeah, I'm going on a cruise and yeah, this is awesome. More so than I had in the past. And lastly, book even a last minute cruise on my own. So you all know, I absolutely love travel agents. And there's a couple of times in which I looked at a cruise at the very last minute and thought to myself, oh, geez, you know, I just want to book this, do this really easily on my own, and I'll pass it back to my travel agent, you know, transfer it back to them. We're good to go. What could possibly go wrong? Boy, did I forget all the little things that a travel agent does that saves me time? Because anytime I had done this, and I did this, I think, once or twice, I instantly regretted booking the cruise on my own. Number one, you got to do the paperwork. So you got to tell your travel agent what happened. Number two, you got to get the form and you got to fill it out and send it in. And in the meantime, you're on your own for a lot of these decisions. And ultimately, later on, some of the things I had done, I kind of regretted in terms of the situation of booking a cabin. Here's an example of one. I booked two connecting cabins, which is something I do all the time for my family. It's one of my favorite family cruise tips. Rather than put all four of us in one room, I get two cabins together, you know, and put two people in one room, two people in the other room. The thing is, I put myself and my wife in one room and the kids in the other room, but my travel agent always was able to put one adult with one kid and one adult with the other kid. And you're probably saying, well, what does this really matter, Matt? Like, why does that even factor at all? Well, it doesn't until you want to buy the Royal Caribbean drink package. And in the situation in which my wife is in the same room as me, well, now I'm on the hook to buy her a drink package, even though she really doesn't want one. That's one like microcosm of an issue. There's other billing situations I ran into. Anyway, long story short, always book at the travel agent. No matter how simple you think it's going to be to do it on your own, 
it's always more work. And inevitably, I think we always make some mistakes along the way. So it's best to leave it to the literal professionals. And that way we can focus on some other things. So there you have it. Eight things that I did on a roller coaster cruise that I won't do again. Let me know in the comments below. What are the things you've tried on a cruise? Maybe there's this year or just in general that you'll never do again. I'd love to hear about them down below. While you're below our video, hit the like button. Subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications. That way, YouTube wants you know we have a brand new video to share. This has been Matt from RoyalCarbonBlog.com. We'll talk again real soon.